All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. This is my vlog. Happy Spooktober. We're doing Army of Darkness review and thoughts. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that's like, oh, the movie and its effects don't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the first two, so it sucks. Whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. So, I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. If I do decide during the video that, I'm, that I want to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn you, hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. I, I will not be warning for spoilers for the first two movies, and once I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie, including discussing the ending. The top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and I implore you to do so. And then there are some links to videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. So, let's dive in. So, this movie is rated R, and there are aspects where it is fairly harsh. I wouldn't quite say it's really a hard R. Um, over the course of this trilogy, the studios gradually gained more influence and control over the filmmaking, and you can kind of see them trying to make it more marketable. It really wasn't super visible in the second one, but here it definitely, you can tell that it's toned down. You know, this is nowhere near as gory and violent as the first two. And the, yeah, there are still horror elements, though I would say overall it's definitely more of an action-adventure film than the first two, where the first one was almost straight horror, the second one is a horror comedy. This one does still have comedy, and a lot of it is very morbid, very dark, but it's nowhere near as, yeah, you know, the the this thing of, like, limbs being cut off and, you know tons of, of blood and, you know, melting body parts and such. There's way less of this in, in this one. You know, there, there is a little bit of that, but then it's... Heh, okay, yeah, I don't want to spoil. So I'll just say it's not quite the same as in the first two. This is something that a number of people have taken huge issue with, I personally don't think it ruins the movie, but definitely do be aware of it if you go into this expecting something that's as strong as the first two when it comes to violence and gore. Now, the IMDb Parents Guide, you know, and I agree with the following, it lists sex and nudity as mild, violence and gore as moderate, profanity as mild, none for alcohol, drugs, and smoking, mild, frightening, and intense scenes where, you know, for some of the others, d yeah, actually, I will just briefly go into, so, the, so, there we go, if the mouse will work properly, you know, yeah, comparatively, the first one was an NC-17, the violence and gore was listed as severe, and so was frightening and intense scenes. The second movie was rated R, violence and gore severe, frightening and intense scenes moderate. So, yeah, pretty significant difference there. And and it is actually like, you know, Raimi was trying to, to, to play along with the studio and, and trying to make it more, you know, with the, with the first two he also tried, but the things he tried really didn't work, so this time he went further and really did away with a lot of, of the, the violence and gore. You know, in, in the first two, like, there's stuff like, oh, you know, some of the blood isn't red, some of it's, like, green and has a very different consistency, you know, some of it's black, and the studios were like, Dude, that is so not what this rating is about. It's it's about the amount of blood. It's not 
doesn't matter if it's not red. So, you know, there's there's geysers of blood in the first two, and some of the time it's it's like black and such. But you know, I don't think that's a problem with those movies. I think it adds texture. You're you're used to seeing red blood in, but yeah, this time there's just way way less blood and yeah. Now the. So yes, I am basing this video on the theatrical. I have watched the director's cut uh, 15 years ago almost, so I don't remember a huge amount of it. I I would definitely say if you have a choice and it's not like way more expensive, definitely go for the director's cut. It is the superior version, you know. And and if you watch both of them, you can very much see okay, there's some stuff here where like. Raimi had a really badass idea, and the studio was like, nope, that's too cool, people are going to like it, you know, the the ratings are going to be on our ass, you know, do away with it, and yeah, absolutely, you know, just, yeah. Now, um, yes, so I have watched this at least three times, possibly more. Uh, there were a number of years where I didn't have access to it. I got the, the copy that I watched today and like half a year ago right before Evil Dead Rise that was you know yeah I got that yeah maybe half a year ago, shortly before I watched it right and my first viewing was in 2006 so the the plot I'm just gonna quote IMDB's here a sardonic hardware store clerk is accidentally transported to 1300 AD where he must retrieve the Necronomicon and battle the dead so he can return home. And... Let's see. Yeah, so like with the first two, you know, the, the camera work is amazing and this kind of just, yeah, hyperkinetic, you know, Sam Raimi loves moving the camera, he loves, like, getting people really into it, and it, yeah, it works incredibly well, and it's the kind of thing, you know, cer certain aspects of the, the first two, I don't know if they would, I, I can see an argument for there being less gore, for just the sort of setting and otherwise tone that it might have been, I don't know that it would have been a problem, but I can appreciate, you know. But yeah, the the some of the other whole you know trademarks of the first two, the the energy, the fact that it just hits the ground running and never stops. Like there's not a boring moment to be found in honestly any any of the five movies, in my personal opinion. Certainly not these first three, but. Yeah, the the you know and yeah the 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 camera work the sort of the the comedy which is really goes like he goes full three stooges here. There are a couple of bits in this where basically a three stooges bit will play out, you know. And I've seen some take issue with the fact that it's not immediately preceded or proceeded by like actual horror and I do think you know I'm not really a fan of the Three Stooges the only Three Stooges stuff I like is when Raimi does references to it and such you know I you know I'm more of a Laurel, Laurel and Hardy person I'm not saying the and and you know the the master um, Chaplin of course you know I'm not I'm not saying that there's something like inherently wrong with you know slapstick from from way back then I enjoyed a lot um, but yeah the the three stooges if you don't love that kind of stuff it might bother you I think the if it wasn't Bruce Campbell doing it and Sam Raimi shooting and editing it then I think I would find it tiring and I do completely respect people who love the first two and thought I went too far here so, ranked other than this, and these are all worst to best, and I love all five of them, the, yeah, the first one, the second one, the remake, and Rise. This is very much a franchise where I feel like they just got better and better. And, uh, yeah, so ranked worst to best of all the Sam Raimi movies that I've watched, Spider-Man 3, and then from here on out, the ones I, 
Yeah, I love the rest of them. Drag Me to Hell, Oz of the Quick and the Dead, The Gift, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Doctor Strange 2, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1. And, yes, you know, the first two movies take a lot of inspiration from EC horror comics, and this one jumps to a bit of a different genre, the, the action-adventure set during the, the, you know, Middle Ages, me medieval times, you know, and it does make a lot of sense. There are a lot of different genres of comic books. You know, there's there's some people who don't even know that these were inspired by comic books because when they hear the word comic, two words, whatever, comic books, they think, oh, like superheroes, which you know nowadays is is really big, and you know, but there was a while where that was not the most profitable type of comic book, and yeah, so. The, the second movie has ten times the budget of the first film. This one has four times the budget of the second film. And that is about where the budget stays for the last two entries. I think it might, you know, I don't know if those numbers are accounting for inflation. And yes, like anything that is at least partially inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and demonizes non-Christian belief systems, this is unfortunately somewhat racist. Honestly, it easily could have been about Christianity, since that features one of the most famous zombies in Jesus. But I can't appreciate that the movie didn't want to enrage the Christians, who, let's be honest, look for any excuse to be offended about their religion and its depiction in media, as if there are not countless pieces of media that have a positive, even propagandistic depiction of it. But the reason for there being supernatural evil didn't need to be, well, supernatural. It could have been at least somewhat, though um, fairly dubious signs, like the original Night of the Living Dead movie that the first movie does take inspiration from in other respects. And let's see. Yeah, so the... Yes, one, one thing I could... Like I mentioned, I don't mind, you know, I, I get being frustrated when there's a franchise, or at least one movie you really like, and then a follow-up does something that you really feel is like a betrayal. So I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. One thing I would say, me personally, one of the reasons I don't find feel that it's a betrayal, you know, the, the overall... A lot of the tone is very similar. You know, this is not just like this is not a Robin Hood movie. You know, this is an Evil Dead movie with a lot less gore and violence, set in medieval times, and with the the genre being more this action adventure. But it's actually it's a really solid action adventure. Like the the battle choreography is excellent. Like this is the kind of stuff that you would find in a really really good action adventure you know yeah yeah like it's not quite as as big but some of the choreography i would say is on the level of something you know other 90s action adventure set during this time something like robin hood prince of thieves you know which i appreciate not everybody loves that movie i don't know if i love it i think there's some good some bad but i feel like we can largely agree really great choreography of, of the action. And, let's see... Yes, so, you know, and, and yeah, it just, it has the, the elements, you know, you, you have kings, you know, yeah, you have a king, you have a wise man, there's a quest, you know, and they manage to still focus primarily on Ash, and there is an explanation for why that is, you know, it's, yeah, it's not even a spoiler, um, they say it in the second movie, Ash is prophesied to be the one who rids the land of the Deadites, you know, so yeah, he has to go on the quest himself, and, you know, when you watch the scene, you might be like, is it really necessary for him to, and then you see the kind of stuff he has to deal with, and it's like, you know what, I get it, I get why, they sent him, and it's not anybody else that's, you know, taking part in this. But, yeah, you know, the first two are set almost exclusively in the cabin. This one, it's, you know, there are more settings, and, yeah. Let's see, so the... 
uh, yeah, so, yeah, in the second and third Evil Dead movies, Bruce Campbell as Ash gets increasingly animated, cartoonish, ridiculous, as they saw that the audience really responded to it, even in the first movie where it was to a much lesser extent, though it was there. And the more broad his character is, the more fun the audience has watching him, and Bruce has playing it, clearly. And here we especially see why Camp is literally part of Bruce's name. And this was also very much, this is, this version of Ash is the one that really permeated uh, through pop culture, uh, you know. And you can see why. He's just, he's so much fun. And this, you know, personal thing, but this movie has by far my favorite score of the trilogy. It, like, really nails the dark fantasy adventure vibe. Honestly, worth listening to outside of watching it. Danny Elfman does amazing work here. He and Raimi are always a great team up. This was the first, but thankfully not last, collaboration between them. And just, yeah. Uh, and this was the first where Raimi, Raimi worked with Bill Pope, who he also worked with on Darkman. And um, Spider-Man. I don't, I don't really know those movies. I'm kidding. And yeah. You know, Bill Pope, otherwise best, perhaps best known for his work on the Matrix trilogy. He also DP'd Shang-Chi. And, yeah, you could, you know, these movies have had really great cinematography from the start. But here, it just completely, just incredibly talented work. You can really see the, the you know, the professionalism, which, you know, that is part of, that is one of the things we love about the, the first movie is it does... Like, there's more enthusiasm than flawless skill on display. But, yeah, by this point, you know, they really had it down. Like, this is the kind of movie where if you didn't know that it was Sam Raimi, if you just, if you just look at the photography, like, some of it really does feel like, oh, yeah, you know, this, I, I don't know, uh, cut scenes from a Robin Hood movie, I, you know, from, yeah, Kevin Costner Robin Hood movie. As mentioned before and this has by far the best variety of characters settings and scenes of the trilogy they visit different places that exist in the kingdom the characters are of completely disparate personalities and level of importance and yeah in 1300 AD and there is at least one scene that does feel like the kind of thing that you'd find in the first two movies Ash by himself in a single location that he can't really leave being tormented by spirits but it's not the entire movie anymore, which does, of course, mean that some hardcore fans of the first and second feel like it just simply doesn't make sense within the trilogy. I... I don't... I do love each of the Evil Dead movies that are almost exclusively set in a cabin. I do really appreciate when the franchise moves outside of that. And I'm not blaming, like, the second movie, you know, some people are like, why did Sam Raimi just make the same movie twice? The studio demanded he would have he would have liked to make Army of Darkness as the second movie. Studio wouldn't fund it, so, you know, he agreed to make a bigger budget, kind of the first, what he would have liked to do with the first movie as the second movie, and... Like I mentioned, I think that each of them, I think they all have enough there that you can really get into it, and it doesn't feel like it's just the same movie each and every time. But I really appreciate it, and it's it's too bad that this one, but, if, you know, this movie did not do quite well enough to justify continuing down this, you know, same path, and in fact, you know, because of the, the yeah, it, you know, it's a cult favorite, cult classic, but it did not quite make enough money at the time, which is why, you know, it was 20 years before we got another official movie in this franchise, and by then, it wasn't Sam Raimi directing, he was producing, you know. I would definitely still say you can feel his fingerprints on the, the remake, but the, the, as well as, um, rise you know but yeah i i think it would have been great if they had kept making these movies and like having just these completely different settings in in time and and such I, yeah like 
the the um, yes uh, right so some critics said you know they they didn't like that in this movie Ash is a jerk and stupid is he stupider than he was in the first two I'm not sure that I completely agree that that's but he he is more of a jerk this time around I think we gotta keep in mind the circumstances though it's it's one of those things where like if a lot of people treat you really badly you might end up being kind of a jerk yourself you know like a defense mechanism kind of thing keep in mind he is surrounded by people in 1300 AD who like you know forget what you saw at the end of the second movie this movie retcons that which yeah um, each of these movies changes something significant about the the yeah you know when you watch the first movie there's no sign of Henrietta in the cabin cellar you know where she like jumps out like almost immediately after Ash is shoved down there in the second movie so you know yeah the second movie ends seeming that okay Ash is just beloved there that's not how it starts here he is treated with a lot of suspicion and yeah you know they they abuse him he there's 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 more there's yeah there are more individuals abusing him in this one than in the first two movies combined as, as we're talking non-possessed ones at least and yeah you know he ends up being kind of a jerk to to the people and i completely acknowledge you know some people wish that he was still you know he's a much much nicer, more, like, positive character in the first two. I do think there's a reason that this was the one that really, like, made a, a huge mark on pop culture. The, the, you know, he is, he is, he survives the first two movies. I'm not going to spoil here if he survives this one. Not all horror movie survivors are super compelling. Like, people want to see them survive multiple horror movies in the same series, and maybe want to see them cross over with other horror franchises, but they're not necessarily the most, like, fun and memorable characters, which Ash, over the course of the trilogy, becomes more and more. Uh, yeah, I, I usually really hate jerk protagonists, but the... I, I don't think every protagonist has to be likable. I think it's okay for there to be, like, interesting a-holes. I don't know if I would say that Ash is super interesting, but he is compelling. And, yeah, it's it's rare for me to... I, I think it is just, yeah, Bruce Campbell, like, he can play the most obnoxious jerk, and you still kind of want to see more of him, you know? He's just... He's so charismatic. It's it's and and like the way he is in this movie, that's like there's a bunch of stuff that he appears in where it's very much this, you know, including Sam Raimi movie cameos. It, it, yeah, cameos Bruce Campbell makes in Sam Raimi movies and such, you know, his his character here also kind of informed the character he plays on Xena. You know, he's just there's a lot of people who can't play a jerk in a way that the audience likes to see. Bruce Campbell just, yeah, he's he's one of the, the people that, that can, you know. There's a reason that this character has, has been in comic books and video games, including video games that aren't, like, purely based on Evil Dead. You know, he's he's crossed over with other major horror properties from, like, the 80s and, and 90s, and, yeah, you know, you want a, a character that really stands out. Especially, like, in a comic book, you have limited pages. You don't have the, like, you can you can do close-ups on a, of a face, but you can't really animate it as such. And there's no voice. Like, the voice kind of has to come across in, like, just the words and the faces and, and body language and such. So it's important for the character to be distinct, you know. There's... There are final girls that I really like, but I don't know if I would love seeing them in a comic book fighting various, like, evil... Yeah, it's, it just wouldn't be as, as interesting to me. 
Another thing I saw, at least one user review criticize, the middle is pretty, of, of this movie, the middle third, is pretty much all comedy. That is true. That It is the kind of thing, that there's scenes that if this was a, if this was one of, if these, if this scene was in one of the first two movies, there would be a lot of gore and, like, straight horror. And with that gone, which I do think, you know, I think Sam Raimi meant for there to be more, like, straight horror in that section. With it gone, yeah, I get why some people found it for, you know, I, yeah, as, as mentioned, you know, as long as it's Bruce Campbell, as long as it's Raimi, you know, in control of, of camera and editing, yeah, it's... It's effective, you know. I'm I'm not saying, uh, you know. I already mentioned I don't love Spider-Man Three. You know, I don't love every Raimi movie I've watched, but this kind of thing, he's just absolutely nails. And that is about. But but yeah, this you know once again, Sam Raimi returns to direct and co-write. This one he wrote with brother Ivan Raimi who he also wrote, you know, yeah, they, they also together wrote Darkman, Spider-Man 3, Drag Me to Hell, and they worked together on the the TV show as well, Ash vs. Evil Dead. And, yeah, really, really, you know, they, they, they're really good together. Um, they get some really great, just, yeah, some, some really fun scenarios and the, the dialogue, you know, which this has by far the most memorable quotes of Ash and they really, yeah, just, you know, th this is the one where it is like, yeah. The, the kind of, I, f I forget, I, f I feel like, was this, am I remembering right that, yeah, you know, the, the um, yeah, I'm just going to quote directly a um, user review here. To prove how awesome it is, Duke Nukem stole a lot of quotes from this movie. And, let's see... Yeah, and the yeah the opening is really solid, and the yeah we get a, a recap like at the start of the second movie, and it is again a lot of fun. And yeah, so I'm not gonna give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I love the director's cut ending. The theatrical I also love, but I definitely prefer the director's cut. And, yeah, so there's not really anything in the end credits that you, like, need to, to see. But I definitely do think that, I, I really appreciate that they play several parts of the Danny Elfman score uh, over the, the closing credits. Because it really is just, yeah, fantastic. Now, the... Yes, yeah, so in addition to Bruce Campbell, we have Empath Davids as Sheila. And yeah, she she does a, a really good job. You know, it's one of those things where like it's difficult to to get right the kind of thing of like she and the others who play characters in 1300 AD it's difficult to make it sound natural saying these these things you know there's there's an early yeah very very early on like the the you know the car lands in 1300 AD being you know yeah it goes with in the time travel because Sam Raimi is obsessed with putting the car the old Oldsmobile I want to say it's called in every of his movies that he can including finding a way to fit it into The Quick and the Dead, the, the Western he made. 
and yeah, like very early on, you know, a couple of knights like try to to stab the car and say the line, "What a mighty piece of armor this is!" Which like right there just you know, you immediately know, okay, this movie is not taking itself too seriously. Even if you somehow missed the first two, which, that's the thing. You can go, if if you don't like super gory horror, but you really like the, the you know, you, you like morbid, you know, you're at the very least okay with morbid jokes, because there's a lot in this, and you want a good action-adventure set in 1300 AD, yeah, you can just sit down and watch this. You don't have to watch the first two. You know, there's stuff that you won't appreciate quite as much, but you'll be able to follow it no problem at all. There's not going to be a thing where they say, oh, so this is like the thing, and you're like, what What are, you ta what are they talking about? Never happens. It's completely, you know, and that was also part of the, part of the thing that they were trying to do with both of these sequels, you know, make sure that people can sit down and watch any one of these and get a get a full story but but yeah empath davids you know she does quite well at that uh she is you know she's called upon to to essentially serve as a love interest of sorts and yeah she does quite well i i wish there was more to her character but i don't blame the actress for that Marcus Gilbert plays Lord Arthur, and, you know, some people take issue with the fact that Ash makes fun of the Arthur. I, you know, when I was a kid, I loved the, the stories of, of King Arthur, so, you know, the movie, if this movie was just making him look just terrible, I would really be bothered by that, and I, you know, it's a matter of opinion. I really don't think that the movie does make him look bad. Ian Abercrombie plays the wise man, and he does a fantastic job. Um, R.I.P. Uh, he, yeah, he does a fantastic job to just really adding this sense of, like, he's, He's one of the few of the primitive screwheads who actually have, like, you know, like I mentioned, you know, the knights see a car f and, and like, try to attack it. And, yeah, most of the people from 1300 AD are really not open to, to Ash and his future technology. The wise man is the one who, you know, he, he very, very quickly clocks Ash as the prophesied one, and I appreciate that they do still have fun with the character. He's not just like a stick in the mud, but yeah, he's, and, and, uh, let's see, yes, and, yeah, Bridget Fonda has a very short cameo as, as Linda in the, in the opening recap, and, yeah, I, I mean, she must not have hated working with Sam Raimi because she later has a very substantial role in A Simple Plan, which came out six years later. So, yeah, you know, and she's fine in this. She's amazing in that. Uh, you know, she's she's not given much of a chance in, in this one. Um, and, yes, Ted Raimi does make... At least one appearance, let's go with that. And, yeah, he's he's always fun. I've never been unhappy to see Ted Raimi show his, his goofy face in anything that his brother has written and or directed. And that brings us... Yeah, so the, yeah, the dialogue is really, really great. There, and... You know, we again have some very, very corny lines put in Bruce Campbell's mouth that, you know, some of them Sam Raimi would come up, you know, come up with right before shooting. And one Bruce Campbell specifically said, that's the corniest thing I've ever heard. But he went ahead and went, you know, he went with it. He found a way to deliver it where it's not like a lot of the lines, if you just read them, they're going to sound like just, okay, this is terrible. But if when you see Bruce Bruce Campbell finds a way to say these ridiculous things, 
that I, I feel like Sam Raimi sometimes just, he liked to see if he could make Bruce Campbell say something incredibly stupid, and it's up to Campbell to find a way to say it where you can still, like, you don't check out of the movie. There are 66 entries in the MDB quote section, and, you know, a few of them are sadly misogynistic. All of the rest of them are great, though. And, yeah, the editing is, is really, really solid here. You know, incredibly important for action scenes, uh, cinematography and editing to, to really, yeah, be able to, to deliver on that. And, yeah, they, they absolutely do. And this, there we go, if the mouse works. So, yeah, this was filmed partially in a uh, studio, but also some um, location shooting in, uh, let's see, yeah, some in, in LA, they found this, this cave, it's, which, yeah, really, really adds to the movie. And this, yeah, Vasquez Rocks Natural Area Park in California, and yeah, they get a lot out of the the locations. It really, like, if you didn't know better, you'd be like, I mean, I don't know how they time traveled and got the entire crew back to 1300 AD, but evidently they did, because it, it's so convincing, and it really, really adds just a strong sense of place. And... Yeah, the, the action scenes do do a good job, like, f you know, working in elements that make sense, that don't, like, go against the, the fiction that these movies create, you know, and, yeah, because of the period, we do, of course, have sword fights, you know, there's one point where Ash is chased on a horse by the, the spirit POV, you know, you have bows and arrows, a crossbow is fired at, at one point, you know, magic stuff, and, ah, uh, let's see, I think I want to, yeah, that is as much as I'm going to say, and yeah, the sound design is, is great, you know, I just, yeah, they, they, the, the Evil Dead are, as always, have, have a very, like, distinct sound design, and, yeah, it really is just, like, I, I wouldn't say that it feels real, because these movies are clearly not quite taking place in reality, but within the fiction, it absolutely works. You know, sound design is one of those things where, like, if it's really bad, it's really distracting. And I think that might be about... Yeah, um, this movie is 80 minutes without end credits and 85 with them. And, yeah, uh, if you're not interested, about 30 minutes into the movie... Yeah, the movie probably is not your kind of thing. Like, there will be more action later in the movie, and the, you know, some of the more morbid jokes come a little later, and, and certainly come faster, more frequently later in the movie. But if it legitimately has not appealed to you, or you just feel like, okay, this is too different from the first two, yeah, uh, you know, it might just not be your kind of film. Yeah, uh, the best elements, uh, the the creativity on display, the dark sense of humor, the, the way that it found a new way to, to do a story within the same overall world and maintaining the same protagonist, which, you know, when you watch the first movie, if you don't already know Bruce Campbell from other stuff, you know, the first, when people first sat down, to watch the first movie, they had no idea that Ash was going to be the survivor. Because, yeah, he's there, but he's not 
focused on more than the other characters, but yeah, near the end of the movie, he it becomes clear, okay, he is the survivor, he's, you know, though he, whether or not he survives that first film is, of course, a matter of whether you only watch that film or if you watch one of these sequels that, yeah, um, but, you know, with the second and this movie, he very much, like, stands out, and, yeah, th you know, th some some people reject the the two new official movies purely because Ash isn't the the protagonist. I, I won't spoil if he shows up in them, but he's not the protagonist. And you know, I I think that's too bad. I think they have a lot to offer. I think it's too bad to to reject movies, uh, to, you know, on on that basis. I I could understand if they didn't deliver on the Evil Dead goodness. I feel they do. Some feel some feel they don't. Um, let's see, and and yeah, just the the way that it, the the use of the setting, and the the fun action, and yeah, the worst aspect continues to be the raging misogyny. Uh, yeah, one of the only I've I've addressed a couple of the criticisms that I I found already. One other is you know some something I saw some people say was really terrible about this movie was what they their claim that it doesn't offer enough variety and yeah I I get why that would bother you if that is how you feel now the first time I watched it the thing I was most worried about was that it would be very dated you know it was 14 years old when I first watched it and yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely, it is very 90s, you know, if, if you're not a big fan of 90s or if you've never watched an action movie from the 90s, this might not be the best place to start, you know, start with something that's a little bit less, like, in your face and high energy, but, yeah, you know. I, I like a lot of movies from the 90s. I love some movies from the 90s. And, yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was Raimi letting loose, and it absolutely delivered... You know, again, the, the one thing would be the, the violence and gore. Now, let's see... And, and, you know, to be clear, this one does deliver more than Drag Me to Hell does, uh, you know, which like, uses up its PG-13 rating by the time the title has been... No. Um, yeah. Moving on. The the trailers do give too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like, and they are worth watching. The cover and poster don't give too much away and give you a good idea of what the movie is like and are also well worth looking up. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 68% from critics compared to the second one's 88% and the first one's 86%. The audience score is 87%, where the second one is 89 and the first is 84%. And there are 87 critic reviews, 59 fresh, an average rating of 6.60 out of 10. And the, yeah, the over 100,000 user ratings, the average rating is 4.2 out of 5. And, yeah, so the consensus, some of the evil magic is gone as this trilogy capper dispenses with most of the scares, but Bruce Campbell's hammy charm and Sam Raimi's homage to classic visual effects make for a fun enough adventure. And on Metacritic, it has a 59 out of 100 from critics, mixed or average, and 7.9 out of 10 from users, generally favorable. And yeah, of the the six, uh, 32 of the 32 Metacritic critic reviews, 47 are positive, 41 are mixed, 13% are 
negative. And let's see. So the and yeah, one one of them says it's tedious. It says that the story doesn't have even marginal coherence. One says it's just downright terrible. And um, one says the Bruce Campbell's character is a complete stiff. Yeah, I I disagree. Um, I yeah, one person says even at eighty minutes, it's enough time for doldrums to set in. And yeah, so on IMDb. It has a 7.4 out of 10 based on 190,000 user ratings. 26.6 gave it 8, 22.8 gave it 7, 16.8 gave it 10, 13.5 gave it 9, 10.6 gave it 7, 4.4 gave it 5, 2.1 gave it 4, 1.2 gave it 3, 1.1 gave it 1, and 0 0.8 gave it 2. And there are 731 um, user reviews, or 618 if you hide spoilers. And I read the top voted 100 user reviews. One of them gave it a 1 out of 10. No one gave it a 2 or a 3. One person gave it a 4. Another gave it a 5. Two gave it a 6. 10 gave it a 7, 33 gave it an 8, 14 gave it a 9, 39 gave it a 10. So this is very much a movie that has found its audience. And there are 257 links in the IMDb external reviews section. So the special effects, once again, really, really solid. You know, there are a few, like, computer effects and that kind of thing, but it's very very there's very little of it very little very few effect shots and very little screen time for them there's a lot of puppetry and like animatronics and some fantastic like makeup special makeup effects um i was actually surprised there's this there's this one deadite character where it feels like they weren't even trying, and it's it's very strange, because there's some other Deadites that look amazing, and some other stuff that I don't really want to give away, but just, yeah, this has some absolutely amazing, you know, makeup on on the faces, and the the antagonist is one of the most memorable. I won't claim it's the most memorable, because... I can certainly appreciate the. You know, I, th I think some of the more prominent of the the eve of the possessed in the second movie. You know, it's very difficult to top Henrietta and the the physical embodiment of the evil from the second movie. But there's yeah the the yeah fantastic antagonist here and. There's some some really great uh, stop motion and some forced perspective that holds up really really well, and I think that is what I will say about the effects. There's also some really solid stunts, um, which is of course action scenes can really thrive on stunts, and yeah, just incredible stunts scenes and I think that is about so the um, I can't speak to every home video release but the the one I have has 14 minute minutes of deleted scenes they're great I'm not entirely sure why they ended up cutting them the movie wouldn't have been like over long or slow or something with them and a two-minute trailer. And I will talk a little bit in the spoiler section, in the first spoiler section, about some of the deleted scenes. 
for those who don't have access to them. I will also be talking about the director's cut ending in at least one of the spoiler sections. And yeah, um, I rank this 10 groovy medieval deadite fights out of 10. So I'm not saying that it's in every respect as good or better than the first two, but I think the strengths here make up for the stuff that, you know, I do think that it would have been really, really cool if this did have the kind of gore that we have in the first two. And there's several places where you're like, oh, there's going to be a big gore, and then there's, it, there just isn't, you know. But yeah, uh, the movie absolutely holds up, and, you know, yeah, deserved a better reception when it was first released, but has found its audience, and I can imagine more people will, you know, the the Ash is still being put in video games. Uh, let's see, when was the... I have right here, so the... Let's see, video games. There was a game just last year, Evil Dead the Game, you know, um, yeah, uh, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Windows, Xbox One, Xbox Series XS, you know, and that one actually has, um, what's it called? It has several playable characters from this, and, uh, let's see, locations from the, the movie also. So, so, yeah, you know, this is definitely... The the I can I can imagine a bunch of people are gonna see that see you know let's see was it well received quick um, yeah it was it was fairly well received uh, seventy six and seventy two out of a hundred on Metacritic depending on which of the versions and some of the rev yeah some of the publications gave very very high review scores 4 out of 5 9 out of 10 uh, that kind of thing you know i can imagine that some people bought that game just based on like you know is it you know well it's you know it's gotten good reviews uh, you know i like zombie kind of stuff you know sure let's give it a, a shot and you know fell in love with the setting and the characters and went ahead and and watched the movie. Huh. Although on Steam, recent reviews are mostly negative and all reviews are mixed. So it's not not everyone loves it. Yeah, there are sometimes, you know, not not all games that are positively received by but um Uh, let's see. Oh, and the yeah, one one person gave a negative because they stopped updating the game. And yeah, uh, another said TLDR: Do not buy this game; it's dead. And yeah, that definitely because it's it's like a multiplayer game. Big deal if they can't if they if they stop updating and it's it's dead. So, yeah, I completely understand that kind of. Th but but yeah, I can imagine that some people played that game and yeah went for the movie as well from from getting really into the game. But yeah, so the the full ranking of every all five Evil Dead movies, keeping in mind the fact that you know. This is worst to best, but I do love all five. The first one, the second one, this one, the remake, and Rise. And to be clear, I'm not one of those people who just automatically like more recent movies better than older movies. A lot of my favorite movies are old as dirt. Like, one of my favorite movies of all time is Metropolis, which I believe, I want to say it's like 1929? I'll little quick get confirmation 27 1927 and I realize some people read that as a hard right like conservative movie 
I appreciate that it can be read as that. I read it as very, very far left, and I, I would not love it if I agreed that it was conservative. Anyway, that gets us to the spoiler section. So, once again, from here on out, spoilers for this entire movie. Starting with notes taken while watching on paper as per usual. So, let's see... Yeah, so in, in the deleted scenes, yeah, one of the first things we see is Arthur declare, you know, take, take him to the pit. And there's a deleted scene where Ash actually punches Arthur, which can help explain why Arthur is like, okay, execute this mofo, you know, because it, it works fine in the movie as it is. But I can appreciate that bit of context, uh, you know, yeah. And, yeah, when Ash is being moved towards the pit, he is abused, because this is the Sam Raimi movie, and, like I said in the review, it, you know, there's more non-possessed abusing him in this one scene than in the first two movies combined. And, yeah, um... Raimi does his excellent usual, you know, build-up with us not seeing right away what the the thing is. You know, just, okay, the pit. Cl the way they're talking about it, clearly dangerous, you know, and there's that one guy in front of Ash who gets pushed in, and, like, there's a few seconds of just complete silence. And then, like, you hear screaming, and there's a geyser of blood from down there, yeah, that's clearly extremely dangerous, you know, and, yeah, and one guy tries to, to run away, and instead of eye cam, we get crossbow cam as it, you know, gets close to, to the guy, and that and the pit scenes are some of where you can very much see, okay, this would have had way more gore if this was if this scene was in one of the first two movies and let's see uh, yeah and yeah ash ends up down in the pit and i like that you know at first he's like got his back to the camera and you just see a hand come into frame in the foreground and then it disappears before ash turns around and and looks you know so again we know there's something there and yeah, just really, really solid action in the the pit, and you know the the thing with you know the spikes, like holy crap, that's that's dangerous looking, you know, and it just comes closer and closer, and one of the best moments of the film in a film full of amazing moments. You know, the, the the wise man picked up the chainsaw and, you know, he didn't, he didn't like, go to Arthur and say, I think we should give this to Ash because he knows that's not going to end. So he was waiting for the right moment. Prophesied one and throws the, the chainsaw and Ash makes a very impressive jump up into the air and, you know, catches the chainsaw on his, his stump. And starts using it like, you know, he didn't miss a beat. And just, yeah, amazing stuff. And, yeah, decapitates that first, uh, pos yeah, possessed, the first deadite. And he makes a very impressive grab with the with the belt, like wrapping it around the, the I want to say it's like a chain being pulled up, you know. And, I mean... When he managed to grab the the Necronomicon in the first movie with the the necklace, you know that was like a last minute decision. Originally, he was supposed to use the the little um, magnifying glass looking thing to to get the the sunlight as as the sun comes, you know, the sunrise, you know, to burn the book. But then they decided against that, and they were like, we put a lot of like the necklace has a lot of screen time we gotta have a payoff 
And so, oh, I don't know. I guess he is somehow able to latch onto the, the you know, so here they're just embracing it. Like, you know what? Ash is just amazing at latching things around, you know. And yeah, he's he's holding on and slowly being pulled up. And it's like, okay, it looks like he's going to be okay from, from the spikes. And then the, the pit beast, like, grabs onto... To, his foot and his drag down, and that's also a really great design on that Deadite. You know, it's it's the kind of really deeply memorable Deadite face as like Evil Ed and and Henrietta. You know, and and I can appreciate people who watched this entire movie and were like, "That's it. We don't get more cool Deadite faces," because a lot of the Deadite, I guess, are. A lot of the possessed in this movie are skeletons, which is super cool. Don't want anyone to leave this video thinking that I don't appreciate a marching army of skeleton warriors, because I do, I love it, but I can appreciate, you know, I don't personally feel like it's, you know, I, I think we got so much really great in the second movie, you know, but I can understand why some people felt that it was too little. And, uh, yeah, but, you know, he manages to, to kick the guy until, or, yeah, the beast, until he lets go and he gets, uh, and, and the spikes just crush the, yeah, really, really cool. And, uh, yeah, once Ash is back out, he starts macho posturing and, yeah, just... Very fun stuff, and it, like straight up, like does a verbal advertisement for the gun, you know, just completely like they don't understand a word you're saying, dude. They they have no idea what any of those things are, you know. Like, I guess the, the yeah, he says the the stock is like I, f I forget which w w walnut or something like that. They might be like, oh, walnut, I heard of walnuts, you know, but the rest of what he's saying. He might as well be speaking Russian, you know, just, yeah, and let's see the, yeah, and that's right, the, the beast actually did manage to escape the, the, the spikes somehow, and is like starting to walk towards, you know, and he just shoots him and folds into just, yeah, amazing stuff. And, yeah, Ash is being treated to, to luxury, and he's being a real jerk, like, spitting out the, the last little part of, I think they fed him a grape, and he's spitting out the, the seed, or whatever, whatever it's called, you know, and just, yeah. And love the, the um, I guess it's not called a chef, is it? But the, the woman who was, like, cooking, getting possessed, and, you know, no, then knocking over the thing, and, you shall die, and, you know, he, yeah, he fights her off, and I love the bit where she's, like, lying there, and, like, the audience knows, because, okay, this is the third time, third time to the charm, this is not her first rodeo, that thing is just playing possum, clearly it's gonna jump up, you know, and you get a close-up where, you know, you see the, the hand approaching her body, and you see her closed eyes, and then she opens her eyes, and we're expecting that it's gonna, you know, the dead eye is gonna grab the guy, but then Ash grabs the guy's hand, because, yeah, he knows this is how that goes, and I love him pulling off a no-look kill, just shotgun over shoulder, pressing the trigger, and just, yeah. And, and that's also the kind of thing, you know, it would have felt completely out of place in the first movie, but yeah, by this point, this is this is Tuesday. He's done this before. He's he's gunning down Deadites all the time. Like, for him, you know, for us, it's been years since the last movie came out, but for him, it's been five minutes, you know. Okay, slightly more, but between the two fights, between him fighting the, the embodiment of the spirits at the end of the second one, and then fighting in the pit in this one, yeah, I'm not sure it's supposed to be more than minutes, maybe hours, I guess it depends on how close to the castle they were when it started. There's a little bit of him, him walking. And yeah, great montage, and he gets a hand, and it's strong enough to crush uh, you know, one of those cups they had back then. 
And yeah, so Sheila wanted to like try to make amends and so she brings him this this cloth which I guess is supposed to like keep him warm and he's like yeah sure I'll use it for my horse she slaps him he kisses her and then they have sex and it's it's just very telling that this is like this is not a super healthy way to view women but that is you know that is the way of of these three movies so just yeah and, you know, then later when Evil Ash rapes her, that's supposed to be like, oh, you know, she used to like sex with Ash, but she hates being raped by Evil Ash. Like, yeah, just, it's, it's gross. Um, let's see, yeah, and, and the, the, the wise man tries to, to get him to recite the words, and he does it, you know, twice. And then it's like, dude, I get it, okay? Just move on. Um, later on, he, he complains about why didn't the wise man say there would be three books. I'm not convinced there are. I think that's the spirits messing with him. You know, I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but based on the, you know, yeah, the spirits like to mess with him. You know, it happens in... The, the first two movies happens a lot in the, the second movie, you know, the, the, yeah, you know, like when he, in the second one, when he thinks he's shot the, the hand that he cut off, and there's just this massive, like, there's several geysers of blood spraying on him, and a little bit later, there's just, like, no sign of that blood when, when the other people arrive, you know, yeah, I, I think that's what's going on, because the wise man does seem like he's very careful to, to do things the smart way. And, let's see, then we have the... Yeah, um, very, very exciting when he's, like, holding the door as the spirit is trying to, to bust it down. And so the, the windmill, that's another deleted scene, uh, you know, originally he actually leaves the windmill briefly, uh, yeah, not, not for a super long amount of time, and right before he gets back in, he sees what appears to be himself, you know, inside, closing the door. So he runs and he opens the door, and then he runs into the mirror, which... You know, they did a fine enough job stitching together in the in the theatrical cut itself of him. You know, he doesn't really leave the, the windmill. You know, he's, like, starting a fire. And then he, like, you know, turns around, sees the mirror reflection, and, and runs into... You know, they, they did a fine enough job. I think the deleted scene works really well. I, I kind of wish it was... I forget if... Is it just part of the... Director's cut. I th it's possible that they just added the entire thing in because honestly, there's nothing wrong with it. The you know sometimes you watch a deleted scene, and it's like okay, I see why that had to go, but here, not really. But yeah, the the you know it's a it's such a great like the entire thing with I guess I'll call them imp ashes the the. You know, subtitles identify their their laughing as impish laughing laughter, and you know they tie him up like you know the the Lilliputians, really nicely done. Which I think actually, yeah, this might be a perfectly decent time to get into. So yeah, in addition to the yeah, so we have some Gulliver's Travels. The, the thing with, you know, yeah, the, the protagonist is tied up by tiny little beings. Um, then you have a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. That's a person from the present going to, to yeah, King Arthur's time. Uh, and films like The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts. I, I don't think I've watched those. I'd like to. You know, I hear fantastic things about those movies. Um, I th I feel like Jason and the Argonauts is the one with like living skeletons. Let's see, yeah, skeleton warriors. You know, so that's that's where that came from. And 
as far as I can tell from like reading what was written by people who watched those movies and this one, you know, doesn't feel like oh Sam Raimi just made, you know, it was just remake or something, you know. And the let's see, yeah, but just yeah, great stuff fighting against them, you know, nailing one of them to the wall with the you know throwing the thing. In. Ramming speed and just they and and the delight that they take in in tormenting regular Ash, you know, and the um, yeah him you know one of them manages to get into his mouth and so he pours boiling water in which I remember like hearing either Ramy or Campbell say, you know the the censors asked for a lot to be removed I don't know why they were okay with the protagonist pouring boiling water into the, like some of the stuff that was removed is like okay there's no way that a kid's going to be able to imitate this but like i mean hopefully no kid is watching this movie anyway but i could see some some kids like think oh i guess i should pour boiling water into my mouth and that's not going to go well for you and the the eye on the shoulder and it's such a great like it's you know he's ah ha, ha. And, Kind of itchy. Wait, what's that? And there's just this eye, and it's just, and it's so fleshy and and like big and expressive too. Like holy crap, you know. And and yeah, um, Sam Raimi appreciates how creepy eyes can be. They can look at the hell out of you. And you know, yeah. Uh, do I want to give away? I'll just say this is not the first time or the last time that he put a, a really creepy eye in one of these supernatural horror movies that he's done. And, um, yeah, the love the part where, like, his torso just has two heads, and, like, evil Ash is, like, making fun of the way he talks, you know, talking over him, and, and so it's just, it's so petty and ridiculous. It just, yeah. And let's see the um, um, yeah, and and you know ends up with with four legs and and actually ends up separate, you know, and and evil Ash is like doing a dance and smacking good Ash in the face, and then good Ash shoots the, the fires the shotgun directly into his face. And I appreciate it. this is not one of those movies where, you know, oh, PG-13 bullets, you get shot and there's no blood, there's no wound. No, no, no. His face is messed up for the rest of the movie. Really appreciate that. And, yeah, his, his body gets chained up. And we have a very funny burial. Honestly, I, uh, I hope to one day take part in a very funny burial. Because it's just, you know, and the the thing with, you know, he's like, you will never receive the Necronomicon. You know, and, and Good Ash is like, what, what, what's that on your face? And and Evil Ash is like, what, what is, huh? And, you know, dirt on his face. It just, yeah. And, yeah, we get to the, the cemetery, which is just so wonderfully creepy. You know, real strong sense of, of location. Like, they could have easily had it be, oh, he takes a couple of steps, there's an economic. No, he has to, like, walk for a while, and there's all these, like, tombstones, and just... And then, you know, with the with the books, the you know, the skeletons start attacking him, and just, yeah. And there's three books, and they have some glorious fun with this, which I also... You know, apparently that's how they rationalized. You know, there's some significant differences between the way Deadites are in the trilogy and then in the remake and Evil Dead Rise. And basically, the rationalization has been, you know, well, there were three books in Army of Darkness. Maybe these two movies are about those other two books, you know, which I'll allow it. You know, I, I don't think the differences are so big that they need an independent explanation, but it's fine. But yeah, you know, he's like, okay, which of these books? Uh, let's see. It must be this one. And it's just this, like, black hole in there. It's like, oh, you know, being pulled in all the way down, and it closes. And then he manages to get it open and climb out. And his face is all messed up. Wonderful makeup there. Just, like, his... 
his face getting like elongated like that, which is something like there's a, you know, it's not it's not the the face, but there's a there's a Laurel and Hardy bit where they get like stretched on on this rack thing, and their arms and legs are are now much longer, you know. So, I mean, it's I I believe Raimi is more into Three Stooges than Laurel and Hardy. Maybe the Three Stooges did a similar bit, you know, but just, yeah, and, and he has to, like, shake his head several times before his face goes all the way back to normal. But just, yeah, really solid effects. Like, if you didn't know he was makeup, it it's incredibly convincing. And I love, you know, he he managed to forget the words. You know, just, and and it's like, I mean, you could have written it down, but then on the other hand, like, this was not a time when everything was being written down, you know, it wasn't as accessible, and Ash is in a hurry, he's being kind of an idiot, so he doesn't stop to think, hey, maybe, you know, I mean, he's he's got stuff in the trunk of his car, maybe there's a pencil in there, or some kind of writing apparatus, anyway. But yeah, you know, he's like, okay, Klaatu, Rata, oh no, what was it? Uh, uh, ne necktie. It was an N-word. It was definitely an N-word. I have an idea. Klaatu! Rata! <laughs> I think they bought it, you know, and he picks up the book, and all the spirits go nuts, and he's like, I said it right, and I just love this arguing with this, the evil spirits, Lord of the Underworld, this kind of thing, as if, you know, they're going to stop in the middle of flying out of the ground and be like, oh, sorry, I misheard, you said the words right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back into, the, into my grave now. It's, just, it's so ridiculous and childish, and I love it, and... You know, yeah, so we see all the, the tombstones, like, flying out of the ground, and, you know, just, yeah, fantastic visual. And then we get some, like, straight-up Three Stooges shtick with, like, skeletons, you know, poking, tr trying to poke eye and, and blocking, and, like, one in the mouth, and just, yeah. And 100% and I get, you know, if you're not into Three Stooges you might find that bit to be just like, okay, can we move on? And, uh, yeah, at one point he gets hit really hard in the head, and we hear birds tweeting because it has become a live-action cartoon. And, let's see, yeah, and, and you know, the, the evil Ash, you know, we have the lightning strike, and he comes out, I live again. And... Big props to you know. I've always I've always really loved the dark man makeup, with the you know like the the lower lip is gone. So it's or, hold on. it's been a while. Is it the upper? At least one of the the lips is just gone, and we just see the protruding teeth. You know, and and yeah, they do something similar with Evil Ash after he you know he's just got this these teeth, and later on like his jaw dislocates and he has to push it back in place several times, you know, just, yeah, love it, uh, not enough, like, because it's just, there's just something about, like, we all have, most of us have teeth, you know, I don't mean to be discriminating against babies and really, really old people here, but we all have teeth, we, you know, it's, it's better to have them than not, but the moment that the lip is, is just gone, that's just like, Seeing exposed teeth like that just really gets us on edge, you know, and, and there's a, it's, it's fairly logical, you know, the lizard brain, like if we see exposed teeth, that means that thing is going to try to eat me. I don't want to be eaten, run away, you know, so seeing the, the teeth there, it just, yeah, and, and apparently it is Bruce Campbell playing Evil Ash at that point still. Phenomenal performance, you know, I, I think he should play more villains. I haven't seen him play very many villains, but he's so much fun. Just the, the and the kind of energetic, enthusiastic performance as he gives us Ash, really in all three, but especially in two and three, 
lends itself extremely well to a villain, you know. And the yeah, and and Ash returns and admits I set them basically right, you know, and the wise man sets up the rest of the film, something that they also do really well in the second film when, you know, we have the, the thing of, you know, ah, oh, the, the missing pages are going to, you know, I, I think it's the, yeah, it's the ghost of the professor, you know, explains the missing pages of the book can end this thing, and here, you know, the wise man explains, if you didn't say the words right, that means that the, the spirits are going to come for the book, they won't, they will stop at nothing to get the book back, we can't fight them off by ourselves, you know. There you go. That everything that happens from that point on in the entire rest of the movie completely explained. There's no point where you're sitting there and you're just like, what what is happening and why? Which, you know, some horror movies have a problem with that. And I'm not one of those people who think that every moment of every horror movie we need to understand everything that's going on. But it can work really well, you know, sometimes it works extremely well to keep us in the dark and keep us guessing, trying to figure out what's going on. But it can work really well to just have a very clear, like, yeah, we understand their goal and we're seeing them work towards that goal. You know, like, can you imagine trying to watch the movie and you, like, miss that bit? And for the rest of it, you're like, w I'm, I'm sorry, what are, they, what are the skeletons trying to accomplish? Why are they even heading towards the castle? What do they care? Kind of thing, you know, but... Yeah, okay, the book, they want the book back, they'll stop at nothing, you know, that's very clear, uh, you know, so so just, yeah, very, very nice, you know, and obviously, the, the if, yeah, and if they get the book back, and, you know, are able to, to use it, they can take, I, I believe he said something like, they'll take over the, the entire, you know, all of, all of the land, or so, something like that, so, you know, you can't just toss it to them either, you know, be cynical like that. No, there's literally no way they now have to deal with the skeleton army. There's no other way. And let's see the um, yeah, the flying deadite grabbing Sheila and flying off. Very very cool design. And yeah, I I can't get enough of the skeleton warriors. Uh, I love that we get the the coffin cough. You know, one of them gets lifted out of their coffin. And, you know, arises, and <laughs> which is, like, it's ridiculous for so many reasons. Like, to be clear, I'm not saying that if you, you know, once you've been lying in a, in a tomb for a long time, I'm sure there's going to be some, some dust in, in your mouth. But he doesn't have a neck. He doesn't have a, a, like, he doesn't have a lungs. Why is he coughing? How is he coughing? You know, and, and I just, I love that the movie doesn't even try to explain that. It's just complete absurdity. Because, like, at the end of the day, the moment that you have skeletons moving, it all stops making sense. There, there's so many different things the human body requires in order to move, you know, circulatory system, veins, the the muscles, you know, it's not enough to have a skeleton. Like, if you hypothetically, like, gave a skeleton energy and life, it wouldn't be able to move. It's not enough to just have the bones, but this movie just acts like it, which is also, like, I can imagine the old movie probably did act like that was enough, and then this movie is, like, pushing it to a ridiculous extreme. And let's see... Yeah, and, you know, Ash does, you know, at first, nobody thinks highly of him anymore, which you can understand why, but then he does manage to, to turn the tide, and, you know, Ted Raimi himself is one of the first to, to join him, you know, you have my shield, you have my sword, I want it back, and the, yeah, we get the, the montage and we see the there's a chemistry book in the back of the the, the ah what's it called yeah you know they they open the the trunk and and there's like a chemistry book some people have said what he just carries a chemistry book everywhere keep in mind he was taking this car to you know spend some time in this cabin by himself you know he's probably like well Linda's gonna be sick to death of me which you know fair enough ends up happening. If we just spend all our time together, maybe I can study. And, you know, yes, he does have a job at this point, but a lot of college students also have a job, you know. So 
yeah, it's a it's a college textbook. Uh, I I really don't. Th I I agree that there's stuff in the movie that really strains credulity. I don't think this is one of them. Uh, see, like let's hypothetically say that you know he opens the trunk and there's like a rocket launcher. Then I'd be like, okay, that's ridiculous, you know. But yeah. And and I I love that like they 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 look at the engine and Ash is like mm, it's just not, you know and they close the trunk and then later the car does reappear so like we didn't see it but evidently like off screen you know maybe Ash was like wait a second I know how we can fix the car you know and he goes and and they you know add all this stuff to it which is just such a it's such a cool car I I I'm not a car person at all but. It's the the you know it's got like the that thing at the front that like sticks out and like you know knocks away enemies and he fires a shotgun from it at one point and there's like a propeller thingy majig which again like yeah it's not completely impossible to to make something like that and and get it to work you know again like let's say that suddenly he's got like I don't know a Tesla coil in there or something it'd be like that's not realistic. Let's see, and um, yeah, and once the siege is completely underway, you know, you may notice that most of the fighters, you know, the the ones like charging once the the uh, yeah once they've busted down the door, a lot of them coming in charging and like fencing, you know the. That's like actors in in costumes. It's not the the puppets that a lot of the skeletons have been up to that point. I think it's perfectly okay. You know, they, it's like these are all of the dead, all of those who have died in battle. Yeah, some of them haven't been dead for that long. A number of them have been dead for long enough that they're just skeletons. But some of them died much more recently. They still have a lot of the body left. And I really appreciate that the movie doesn't try to sell, you know, just puppets. There's a little bit of, like, puppets, like, fencing with, with regular people. But a bunch of it is, like, actors in, like, costumes that make it seem somewhat like they, you know, this is, this is an ex-fighter who has been raised from the dead. I love so much that they're, like, playing instruments that are made of bones to, to like, you know, keep spirits high during the march. So there's like a, a, a thigh bone, maybe, like, whistle. And the, the you know, there's one person who's got, like, two thigh bones and, like, playing drums, and the drums are all, like, skulls. It's just, I love the creativity on display. It's so good. Because this is the kind of stuff, like, if you can, why wouldn't you? It's so much more fun. Just, yeah. And, yeah, love the explosive arrows, and it's this great thing of, you know, the, the um, Torch Boy, and he, he's nice enough to not knock this one to the ground with his foot. Like, that was so unnecessary. Sword Boy, and, you know, he pulls out the sword, and he just, like, uses his foot to, like, knock this kid to the ground. It's like, what's your problem, man? What the... You, you did not have to do that. Like, he could... Even if you need, like, oh, the, you know, it's difficult to get the sword out of the sheath, if you know what I mean. But just have him, like, move away. Have someone pull him away or something. There's no need to, like, knock him to the ground. Like, anyway. But, yeah, you know, lights all the, you know, the bows and arrows. And, yeah, he made explosives, which, yeah, if you know what you're doing, you know, you can, you know, I, I don't know if I should be saying this, but, yeah, like, it's, it's, possible to make explosive substances out of you know so yeah it's it's you know if he had done it at the windmill i'd be like would there really be enough but you know he did it at the castle they have you know the some of the stuff used for it they would probably be using for completely different things normally but they have it because a bunch of people live at the castle and Evil Ash does the the Xena war cry, the ululations, and let's see the what the what did I write? Um, oh, right, that yeah. And then we get the the car, which 
I haven't played any of the games. Please, someone tell me that's that's got to be in one of the games. It's too much fun not to. You know, he's driving around, he's crushing skeletons, he's firing the shotgun. You know, some of them are getting like torn apart by the the spinny thing. Just fantastic. Like it's it's so it's such a gimme. You just gotta. It doesn't even have in the game. It wouldn't have to be able to do all those things. Just at least some of those things. Just yeah, so much fun. I really appreciate how the car becomes more and more prominent across the trilogy. You know, in the first one, it gets them there. It gets them back to the, the bridge where they see that the bridge is gone. And then the second one, you have the car chase, you know, with the POV spirits following him. And then in this one, it's a weapon. It's a, you know, just... And, and it does feel like, you know, obviously, not exactly like, but it feels like something you might build back then. The This thing of, like... It, it feels like a siege weapon, you know. And then we have the... Let's see. Right, and the, yeah. Um, very cool when the, the spear... Uh, let's see, is this... Crap, I forget if this is the part, but the... Yeah, I think it might be this, where, where like, the, the spear is, you know, Sheila is trying to, to stab Ash with, uh, you know, just, yeah, really, really nicely done. Uh, the And, and it, again, it feels like something the Deadites of the first two movies would do. And, yeah, very, very cool when Henry, Henry the Red and his forces join. And it is this thing of, like, it seems, you know, it's, it's hopeless, utterly, utterly hopeless. You know, the, the, it seems like they're getting overpowered and, and they're like, you know, we can't do this without Henry. Where are his forces? I guess he's just not, you know, they did, you could understand if he, you know, like last he saw Arthur, Arthur tried to have him executed. You could understand if he didn't want to join, but, you know, he does show up just in the nick of time. And, yeah, you know, this movie has more stuff, more individual evil spirits than in the, the first two combined by far. But most of it is in this last third, which I can appreciate. You know, some people might have felt like, you know, there there needed to be more earlier in the film. You know, in the, in the first two, we have some great taunting by, like, possessed people that we knew before that point. You know, which is also, I, I um, yeah, not a lot in this one. Most of the... Most of the Deadites are not people that we knew before then. You know, you have, you do have Deadite Sheila, and, you know, obviously Evil Ash. I guess that is actually about it. So I, I don't know if Raimi just felt like that was played out, or, or what. You know, the vast majority of the skeletons, we have no idea what they were like as, you know, back when they were alive. Uh, yeah, and then we have, like, you know, Sheila says, you found me beautiful once, and Ash responds, you got real ugly. I mean, obviously I hate the misogyny of that. I'm also just like, what are you talking about? She is by far the least ugly deadite in the entire trilogy. Honest, honestly, having watched, yeah, of, of the five official Evil Dead movies, she's by far the least ugly. I, I don't know if it was like, I don't blame the actress if she was like, no, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sit in makeup for hour after hour. I don't want to appear in a movie really unattractive because, you know, part of, like, sadly, a lot of people are going to judge her based on that. There are women who, you know, they were really talented, but because they appeared really conventionally unattractive in at least one movie, it really damaged their career, you know. Um, hopefully it wasn't, like, a studio person saying, no, I don't want an ugly woman in my movie, but, yeah, I, I don't know. It just, it feels very... I, it's, it's one of those things where... Holy crap, I just really... Yeah, obviously, Deadite Sheila is the third of the... You know, so we have at least three people that we see both regular and possessed version, but yeah, you know, it's almost like why even bother making her a deadite if it's gonna be that 
little of like it's is it's less makeup than even the simplest of the Deadites in the first movie, you know, which I want to say was maybe Cheryl, whose face was not that, you know, it was mostly, like, pale, but she did at least have the, the contact lenses, and, and this, like, I mean, basically just, yeah, like, pale face and a little bit of, like, scar stuff, but, you know, very, very simple, like, um, I'm watching, like, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., there's a character, a female character who has much more significant scarring on her face than, than, possessed uh, Sheila so yeah moving on yeah really love the the sword fights here at the end where like Ash has a sword in each hand and he's fighting evil Ash on one side and a you know one of the the skeleton warriors on on the other and then you know there's a part where both Ashes have two sword you know a sword in each hand it's just really really great stuff and Evil Ash is set on fire and like falls and then he comes back and we have you know the the skull with with eyes the the cover of the the second movie so yeah really really great stuff and yeah uh Ash manages to the, the yeah yeah when he comes back he's full skeleton and he you know good Ash manages to to blow him up you know, send him into the air and blow him up, which is also great. You know, when when Good Ash lands next to the explosives, you know, there's several seconds where we're like, oh no, is is Ash gonna gonna blow? Up? How is he gonna get away from there fast enough? Because because the fuse is getting very short. You know, and yeah, you know, Ash fires the shotgun to shoot off the the hand. Or wait, or was it a? Did he use a... He, he, he knocks off the hand, at least. And, you know, yeah, sends him flying, and he explodes in midair. That's how you end, like... If you want to get rid of an, an antagonist, which seems to be able to come back from just anything, yeah, launch him into the air, blow them up. That's a really cool, memorable... Yeah. And, yeah, and then there's, like, a moment where we're worried, you know, is Henry and Arthur going to start fighting? Are their forces going to start fighting? But they hug it out. Friends got a hug. And, let's see, yeah, and, and you know, we, we get the, so, so, yeah, the theatrical ending, you know, Ash has been explaining, has been retelling this entire story, that's, hence the narration at the start, has been retelling this entire story to the... Um, the Ted Raimi character, the the disinterested, uh, you know, fellow S Mart worker, and you know, he's asked, "Did you say the words right?" Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, and we get an epic ending with the, you know, yeah. Of course, he did not, in fact, say them right, and the, the, yeah, a possessed attacks, and again, great action, you know, he manages to, to take her out, and yeah, just really, really cool ending. Before I move on to the, the next section, I do want to briefly talk about, so, the director's cut ending, the, the, um, hold on, I have it written, let's see, the, the director's cut ending is the apocalypse finale, which, yeah, so we see him, you know, go, we see him get the, the, actually use the, the th thing that he has to drink in order to, to go back to, to our time, and he accidentally, you know, he's he's like taking. He, so let's see, it's thirteen hundred AD. So he's got to take like six or seven or some something like that. And he actually, you know, he gets distracted by a noise. And then when he takes another, you know, he accidentally took too many. And it's it's one of those great things where if you sit and you count carefully, you can see, yeah, he he took one too many. You you understand why the character messed up because he's you know he's preoccupied. 
but yeah, you know, I, I, I gotta say, it's, it's a pet peeve. I really hate when there's something like that in a horror movie, and you, you rewind it back and you watch, and it's like, no, what are you talking about? They did it the right, that was the right amount, that was the right procedure or something like that. You know, it's so great when, when the, when they're careful, the filmmakers to, to make it actually fit. But yeah, you know, so he, he sleeps for, for hundreds of years. And, you know, he comes back, he's like, amazing, I'm back in the fight, you know, and, and then he sees, like, ah, I've, is it like Big Ben? It's, it's some kind of national monument or some kind, you know, and it's, like, clearly this, like, post-apocalyptic thing, and he's like, no, I slept too long, and it's, it's glorious, I love it, and apparently that was gonna lead into a fourth movie where he would fight deadites with robots and i i really hope at some point we do get that movie because i i would love that especially i guess if it was made today i don't maybe it wouldn't be sam raimi directing it but just there's so much potential there and i really i i i think that's the way to go with the the evil dead franchise i think you know to to really yeah you know go different places and different times and that sort of thing Although I suppose, I, I don't know where you would go after, you know, the, the post-apocalyptic future with, with robots. I don't know. Space? Is that too far? Anyway. But just, yeah, really, really love that ending. And it's, yeah, I, I gotta say, uh, to me, you've gotta end an Evil Dead movie. That's, if, it, if it stars Ash, you gotta end it with Bruce Campbell, like, going, No! Or, or, you know, shrieking like he did in the first one. Something like that. You know, that's, in my opinion, that's the way to end one of these. But, yeah. The studio was like, we are not doing robots and, and post-apocalyptic future. Reshoot it. And he came up with the, the, you know, yeah. Having him be retelling the story in the, in the present day uh, instead. And that brings us... Uh, right, and yeah, so this movie does have tension and suspense, but it's not always around, like, horror elements as it was in the in the first two. Sometimes it's around, like, action. I can appreciate that some people were probably disappointed that there was not more, you know, tension and suspense when it came to the, the horror. Final section, notes taken before watching. So... Yeah, once again, the rape is completely unnecessary. Um, yeah, you know, it's 100% within the logic of these movies for Sheila to simply be infected by being, you know, stabbed or something that, you know, if that's all it takes for other people to be possessed, you know, the the and in addition to Evil Ash raping Sheila, there's also implications of some of the skeletons raping, you know, there's like a skeleton who says, you know, we've got plans for you, girly, or something like that. Like, it, you can make villain characters d despicable without having to, you know, imply rape. That's completely unnecessary. And, like, if you took the rapes out of these movies, th we would still think that the evil dead are despicable and, and want them to be taken out. And to be clear, I'm not saying that no movie can ever depict the act of rape. Among my favorite movies are Monster, but that's a movie that actually explores the after effects of rape. It doesn't just use it to shock the audience. You know, yeah, in, in each of these Evil Dead movies that has a rape, the, the rest of the movie doesn't really explore the, the impact. And let's see that... Yeah, so, yeah, in the first two movies, Ash goes into the cellar of the cabin, encounters evil, and in this he gets thrown into a pit, and instead of a cabin, we have a windmill, aka dead bird graveyard, and let's see, yeah, and, you know, in the first movie, Ash is trying to touch a mirror, not entirely sure why, he's able to plunge his hands into the mirror, which now has a water-like surface. In the second one, a duplicate of him grabs him from the mirror, argues with him over whether or not things are actually fine, and in this one, Evil Ash straight out comes in part out of the mirror, so I really appreciate this gradual increase raising the stakes, 
you know, and this time Evil Ash is actually the main antagonist, you know, the, the, in the second movie, you know, we have the, the hand as one of the antagonists, but this time it's the entire body of, of Ash, and I'm really glad that they made this decision to, like, split them in twain, because, Mark Twain, because they, you know, it would really suck to not have good in. Good, bad, he's the guy with the gun. Ash, for the rest of the movie. You know, but but yeah, it's just, it's such a great way to, to raise. And I also, I quite like that, you know, he sees the evil Ash in a mirror. And it's like, oh, I better, you know, I better stop that. And, he, you know, smacks into the mirror and he thinks, okay, this is it. But then they, you know, the little imps jump out of the shards of the mirror. And it takes a little work for them to get to, to full size, which also helps explain, you know, why are, what are they doing until, you know, why are they, like, just, you know, poking him in the butt with a, you know, sharp thing? You know, why not immediately attack? Well, they needed to, to subdue him, get one into the mouth, and then, you know, emerge from his body, which is also a, a really great, like, bit of... You know, all, all of these have body horror, and it's definitely not as intense as the first two. But yeah, like, imagine having an, an evil version of you grow from inside your own body like that. And that is apparently a reference to, to this, there's this other movie that has something very similar. That's, you know, that was where Sam Raimi got the, the idea. So, that is it for this video. Let me know in the comments what was your favorite bit with a skeleton in this entire movie. You know, um, I guess I can, you know, a couple of mine are the, the coughing skeleton for how nonsensical it is. The, the, the ones playing instruments. Um, and... The, the one that gets crushed when, you know, one, one of them's like crawling towards Ash and it's got like a knife, I'll cut your gizzards out. And he's like, you know, cuts a rope, gets up in the air, and it's like looking up and then he's smushed by this heavy bag, you know. Uh, yeah, if you like this video, right, and also let me know, you know, hypothetically, if Sam Raimi had gotten to make a fourth movie, would you have liked to see Robots vs. Deadites? and or, you know, something else. So, yeah. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of Loki, the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Blood Curse. I try to do a daily. I don't always make managed to do it every single day episode of a Marvel TV show other than the you know I'm, I'm working my way th through them I did already do all of the Netflix ones currently I am near the end of season two of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. which means pretty soon I'm gonna start on season one of Agent Carter I'm gonna do all of those shows in the order in which they originally aired and recently, the Reviewing Thoughts video is something about very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back channel. This was kind of next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching the recording. I'll catch you next time. And remember, hail to the king, baby. He's not just the boss baby. He is the king of all of the babies. And that is not an easy job. Klaatu. Rata. <laughs> Oh, come on, I said it right.